This podcast contains adult themes, some offensive language, and may be disturbing to some listeners. Discretion is advised. Welcome to Class A Felons B Film C Cups. We're your hostesses. I'm Paris. And I'm Desi. Today's episode in our series on accessories to murder is titled Carolyn Bryant, Whistlebait and the Murder of Emmett Till. 1955, Money, Mississippi, the Deep South. The little town of Money, population 400, lay in the sweltering, dreamlike world of the Mississippi Delta. This area of northwestern Mississippi has been called the most southern place on earth by historian James Cobb and a reference to culture, not geography. There wasn't much to do in this quiet place except gamble and drink soda pop. And there wasn't much to see except small shacks, dirt roads, mom-and-pop grocery stores, and fields of rice, cotton, and sugarcane. The majority of the locals were African Americans. It was a place that brought to life Robert Johnson's blues and William Faulkner's haunted novels. That summer, 14-year-old Emmett Till was excited about visiting his uncle, aunt, cousins, and East Money. He took the train alone from Chicago. His mother Mamie warned him to be careful. She was originally from the Delta and knew how dangerous and how easy it could be to get on the wrong side of the whites in the area. Nevertheless, she was glad that her Bobo, the nickname his family had bestowed upon Emmett while Mamie was pregnant with him, was growing up and getting to travel. He was a good student, although quiet in school, and he attended church regularly with his grandmother, a deeply religious woman. He had a thing about nice clothes. He liked to wear straw hats and ties when he went to church, but even when playing baseball, he tried to look his best. He was 5 feet 4 inches tall, 160 pounds, and at 14 had not yet had a girlfriend. Mamie had worried he would die at the age of 6 when he developed polio, but he survived with only a stutter and orthopedic shoes to remind him of his brush with death. She allowed him to wear a prized possession when he left for Mississippi, a silver ring engraved with the initials LT that had belonged to his deceased father. It was a little too large for him, but he wrapped tape and string around it to make it fit his finger. Emmett was a prankster and loved to tell corny jokes and mimic famous comedians, so his cousins were also looking forward to his visit. As a bizarre and totally unrelated side note, Emmett's estranged father, Louis, had been convicted of raping two women and murdering a third while stationed with the U.S. Army in Italy. He was executed for these crimes in 1945. Mamie had left him in 1942 because of his abusive behavior. The army sent his few remaining belongings to her, and she saved the silver engraved ring for Emmett, thinking that he might want something of his father someday. During his trip to Mississippi a decade later, Emmett would face his own execution via a shop owner named Carolyn Bryant, her husband Roy Bryant, and her brother-in-law, J.W. Millam. The two men knocked on his uncle's door in the middle of the night, demanding Emmett leave with them. They took him to an isolated shed, beat him, tortured him, and shot him, then threw his body into a nearby river where it was discovered days later. Emmett had suffered two broken wrists and a fractured thigh bone. His left eye was gouged out, part of an ear was missing, a tooth was knocked out, and the back of his skull was smashed. He had also been shot in the head. Mississippi had the notoriety at the time of being the U.S. state with the largest number of lynchings, the most lynchings per capita, the most lynchings without an arrest or conviction, the most female victims, and the most multiple lynchings. Now, do we know why his uncle allowed him to take him? Or if he was just fearful? Yeah, he was, he would have been really scared. So he's out in the middle of nowhere. And then, you know, these, these two white men, he's taught to be very subservient to, to whites. He would have known that if he didn't hand him over, that there would be worse repercussions to come. So I'm sure he felt like he had no choice. So on the 24th day of August, 1955, Carolyn Bryant was working alone in the store that evening. Although her sister-in-law Juanita and her two children, along with Carolyn's two children, were in the living quarters behind the sales floor. Around 8 o'clock that evening, 14-year-old Emmett Till entered the otherwise empty store. Exactly what happened after that has only been described by Carolyn, with the only other person present no longer alive after that day to either corroborate or dispute her account. What is known is that Emmett, 
his cousins, and a few of their friends drove to the main street of the tiny town. A local boy suggested that Emmett, the visitor, go inside and get a look at, quote, the pretty lady in the store. One of the friends went in first, made a purchase, and quickly left. He thought Emmett, who wanted to buy some bubblegum, was right behind him. In less than a minute, Emmett did emerge from the store. What he said, if anything, I don't know, his cousin later testified. In the following days, various possible faux pas were reported. It was alternately rumored that he waved and said goodbye to Carolyn, that he failed to call her ma'am, and that he made the error of placing his bubblegum money directly in her hand rather than on the counter. Any of these, coming from an African American, would have been considered insolent behavior toward a white woman. And whatever he said or didn't say, he was murdered for it that night by Carolyn's husband and brother-in-law. Carolyn, whose maiden name was Holloway, was 21 years old and a petite 5 feet 2 inches tall and 103 pounds with black hair and blue eyes. She was born prematurely on July 23, 1934, weighing just 4.5 pounds. Her father, Tom, was a plantation manager on the Archer Plantation, about 10 miles from Kruger, Mississippi, another small town in the Delta. He also worked as a prison guard at the notorious Mississippi State Penitentiary, where his job was to ride on horseback to oversee and dole out punishment to black prisoners doing manual labor. Her maternal grandfather, Lee Pikes, owned a mill nearby and was also a bootlegger. Carolyn claims that when she was 10 or 11 years old, she asked a 14 or 15-year-old male African-American acquaintance for a ride to the store on the back of his bike. He agreed, and as she climbed into the rack, her aunt instantly screamed at her to get in the house. She told Carolyn that people would talk about her for riding with boys. Later, Carolyn related, quote, I don't remember being around him much after that, so maybe he and I both got corrected. In high school, she'd won beauty contests. Her father passed away when she was 15 from a stroke at age 63. She met Roy, a local young man, around the same time. They loved going to the drive-in, and their favorite film was Shane, starring John Wayne. Roy was the eighth of 11 children. His mother's first husband had died after she gave birth to her first five kids, which included John William, known as J.W. or Big Millum. She then married her late husband's cousin, Henry Bryant, a.k.a. Big Boy, so J.W. and Roy were half-brothers. Their mother, Eula Lee, was reportedly arrogant, outspoken, and overbearing. After Big Boy deserted her, she began carrying a revolver in her purse everywhere she went, just in case she ran into him. Carolyn later said that the family believed they could do anything they wanted to do and get away with it, especially after a close friend of theirs was elected sheriff. In the spring of 1951, when Carolyn was 16 and Roy 20, they married in the living room of the local Baptist minister's parsonage. She pretended to leave for school that morning, but instead, she and Roy eloped. She never returned to finish high school. Roy enlisted in the military in June of 1950, 10 months before he married Carolyn. He served for three years in the 82nd Airborne and returned home, settling in the isolated crossroads Mississippi town called Money, where his brothers had set up a general store for him to run. Not long after they married, a terrifying incident would foreshadow Emmett Till's murder. Eula Lee had her own store in Sharkey, Mississippi, and an elderly African-American man entered it one day. He neglected to call Roy's sister Mary Louise Ma'am, which infuriated her husband Melvin. He pistol-whipped the man, and the gun immediately went off. No one was shot, but the man was bleeding heavily from his head wound, which spattered onto Mary Louise's white blouse. As Roy and Carolyn ran out from the back room, they found their family members laughing. According to Carolyn, Roy felt bad for the man and drove him home after cleaning his wound, which contrasts with the way he would later treat Emmett Till in an uncannily similar circumstance. Like his mother and brother-in-law, J.W. was similarly arrogant. After turning 18, Carolyn has said, she was excited to vote for the first time in an upcoming election. When she mentioned it to J.W., he told her, Oh, you don't have to worry about that. I've already voted for you. According to Carolyn, she was livid about him taking that experience away from her and not even telling her he had usurped her voting privilege until she brought it up. At the time of Emmett's murder, she had two sons, Roy Jr., who was three years old, and Thomas Lamar, who was two. She had been married to Roy for four years. Their store, Bryant's Grocery and Meat Market, was on the first floor of a small two-story building. They sold food staples, tobacco, beer, snacks, pickled pig's feet, dill pickles, pickled eggs, cold drinks, and candy. They lived on the first floor behind the area of the store, so I don't know what was on the second story. In front of the store was an awning. Underneath it on the porch 
They're mostly African-American customers could sit and play checkers. The store, the post office, and the filling station comprised all of downtown money. The most poignant event after the murder was Emmett's mother Mamie's decision to hold an open coffin funeral and to allow journalists to publish photos of his post-mortem body. She wanted the world to know what had been done to Emmett, and more than that, to see it with their own eyes, because any description of the damage done could not fully convey its horror. After being transported back to Chicago, Emmett lay in a glass-covered, airtight coffin to contain the odor of his waterlogged corpse. Somewhere between 100,000 and 250,000 people stood in line to view the body. Chairs had to be set up outside the church for the scores of people who became sick or fainted at the site. So, were most of the viewers sympathetic? Oh yeah, yeah. Because it, it took place back in Chicago in his hometown and most of the mourners, or the onlookers, were African Americans. So they were like part of the community. So it was not near Mississippi where Carolyn and her family lived at all. Yeah. So because Mamie had been so diligent in making sure the murder was widely publicized, newspapers, magazines, radio, and TV began reporting it early on. A news bulletin to announce Emmett's body had been found even interrupted the national broadcast of I Love Lucy. To the surprise of everyone inside and outside Mississippi, a grand jury issued indictments against J.W. and Roy. They would stand trial, a very public trial, for Emmett's murder. During the trial itself, nearly a hundred journalists camped out near the courthouse in Sumner, Mississippi, and its proceedings were reported internationally in London, Jakarta, Copenhagen, Dusseldorf, Paris, Istanbul, Rome, and Stockholm. In the lead up to the murder trial, Carolyn became an instant worldwide obsession because of her looks and the notoriety of the case. William Bradford Huey, the journalist who would later obtain the confessions of J.W. and Roy for Look Magazine, called her, quote, one of the prettiest black-haired Irish women I ever saw in my life. As far away as France, newspapers christened her a, quote, crossroads Marilyn Monroe. This type of publicity, it should be noted, can uphold the common myth that beautiful women are often inherently good or need a special protection. Roy and J.W. had five attorneys representing them at their trial. They urged the judge to begin proceedings only a week after Emmett's body was found, so that the prosecutor wouldn't have enough time to put a case together. One of the attorneys, C. Sidney Carlton, also engaged in witness tampering by visiting Emmett's uncle, the Reverend Wright, and suggesting that things, quote, might not go well with him if he fingered Millam and Bryant for the murder. For the trial, as was the custom in Mississippi, no African Americans or women of any ethnicity were allowed to serve as jurors. Of the 12 white males on the jury, 9 were farmers, 2 were carpenters, and 1 was an insurance salesman, who was the only one to wear a necktie, but only on the first day. At least once during the trial, the White Citizens Council, which was a less branded ideological version of the KKK, called on each juror at home to ensure they voted, quote, the right way. Because of the sweltering 100-degree delta heat, the judge encouraged a relaxed atmosphere in the courtroom. He allowed men to remove their suit jackets and smoke cigarettes. He sipped bottles of Coke and encouraged everyone else to do the same. Some took that a step farther and sipped beer without reprimand. He was also friendly with the press, allowing reporters to take all the pictures they wanted before court sessions began and during intermissions. However, when Ernest Withers, an African-American photographer for the Memphis Tri-State Defender and a former police officer, snapped a photo of the spectators, a man in the spectator section suddenly jumped up. And I'm not going to say here what he actually said, but I'm going to substitute it with N-word. N-word, don't take my picture. Withers glanced toward him and responded, Don't worry, I'm only taking pictures of important people today. In a similar vein, Sheriff Strider, the sheriff who was such good friends with J.W. and Roy, would stroll into the courtroom each morning, walk up to the segregated black press area, which consisted of a card table, and nonchalantly address them. Good morning, inwards. As for the rest of the community, 
They were amazed to see white and black reporters from other areas of the country who are friendly with each other, often sharing notes and information. When the African-American U.S. Congressman Charles Diggs from Michigan expressed interest in the trial because his ancestors had originally been from Mississippi, he traveled down with armed guards and sent his business card in while he waited in a car. Sheriff Strider, always on courtroom duty it seems, told his deputy, this N-word here says there's an N-word outside who says he's a congressman, and he has corresponded with the judge, and the judge told him to come down and he would let him in. The deputy replied, This guy said an N-word congressman? Sheriff Strider, That's what this N-word said. When Congressman Diggs was admitted entrance by the judge, everyone in the courtroom seemed just as shocked as the sheriff. Emmett's uncle, Moses Wright, was the first witness for the prosecution, despite being warned that his testimony was akin to suicide. According to author Timothy B. Tyson, quote, Neatly dressed in a crisp, clean white shirt, black pants, a thin, dark blue tie with light blue stripes and white suspenders, Wright tugged nervously at his thick, working man's fingers that had been clearing fields of cotton. I wasn't exactly brave, and I wasn't scared, he later said. I just wanted to see justice done. Appealing to the sensibilities of the jury, the prosecutor addressed his witness with the dismissive monikers of Uncle Mose and Old Man Mose. But his request that his witness ID the murderers in the courtroom created a momentous and historic moment when Reverend Moses Wright stood up and pointed decisively at J.W. and Roy, who both shifted nervously in their seats. A wire service bought the photographer's entire roll of film on the spot. The image became an iconic symbol of courage and appeared in newspapers across the world. Moses was a public figure for the remainder of the trial, strolling around with a pink banded hat tilted back on his head. He did not appear for the verdict, however. In all probability, he knew how the trial would turn out. When asked later how he found the courage to testify, he replied, Some things are worse than death. If a man lives, he must still live with himself. So super brave to do that. So do you know, was he threatened afterwards? Like, that's pretty scary. I don't know. I mean, like I said, he was threatened beforehand. Right. Yeah. After Afterwards, you know, I, I feel, well, the way the trial turned out probably took some of the steam out of people who would threaten him, but I don't know for sure. And I know that some of the witnesses talked about moving afterwards. So I don't think he he was one who moved, but I know some people did move out of the area. So, you know, to, in order to avoid threats. And then there was another witness, Willie Reed, who also displayed unflinching courage, despite the fact that he was only 18 years old and also African-American. He had seen J.W.'s truck and the men taking Emmett to the shed. He ID'd the two men, knowing full well that he might be killed for it, or at the very least, and, you know, as we mentioned, have to change his name, move away, and live in hiding. Emmett's mother, Mamie, arrived from Chicago to testify. The New York Times reported that she was a, quote, composed and well-spoken witness and a pretty brunette who wore a black dress with a white collar and a red sash. Another reporter for the New York Post described her as wearing, quote, a black bolero and a printed dress with a small black hat and a piece of veil, very different from the cotton patch copper. Yet another writer noted of Mamie, quote, she is a demure woman whose attractiveness was set off by a small black hat with a veil folded back, a black dress with a white collar. In the more than 99 degree heat, she fanned herself with a black fan with a red design. The Greenwood Commonwealth newspaper wrote that, quote, The fashionable dressed 33-year-old had an air of confidence and determination. Her answers were direct and to the point, using good English and speaking in a highly audible tone. At only one point did she display any emotion. That occurred when she was shown a photograph of the body. After looking at the picture, Mamie sobbed, took off her glasses, and wiped tears from her eyes. Carolyn was the first witness for the defense. She testified without the jury being present because the purpose of telling her version of events was really confusing. Up to this point, the defense had maintained that J.W. and Roy didn't have anything to do with Emmett's death. But Carolyn's testimony provided a motive as to why the two men would want to kill Emmett. So on the one hand, the defense wanted to argue that their clients did not murder Emmett, but on the other, he had it coming and it was his own fault he was dead. In any case, the defense knew her testimony would be leaked to the jury, and they knew that gossip had already provided them with the defense's version of events. And they made sure of this in their closing arguments when Carlton chose the word molested to describe Emmett's interaction with Carolyn. 
She introduced herself to the courtroom as Mrs. Roy Bryant instead of providing her own given name. She described Emmett as, quote, this inward man who came in the store and stopped there at the candy case. According to Carolyn's trial testimony, Emmett picked out the candy he wanted, and when she held out her hand instead of paying, he instead grasped all the fingers of her right hand in his palm in a strong grip and said, How about a date, baby? Carolyn then jerked her hand loose and walked toward the back of the store. Emmett followed her, catching up to her at the cash register. He placed his left arm around her with his left hand on her left hip, his right hand on her right hip, and said, What's the matter, baby? Can't you take it? When Carolyn again freed herself, Emmett's next words were, You needn't be afraid of me. I've blanked with white women before. Now, Carolyn refused to say or even hint at what the verb he allegedly used was. Her delicacy, however, vanished with her next words, stating that, quote, This other N-word then came into the store, took Emmett by the arm, and told him to come on. Emmett followed him out, but then turned around at the door and said simply, Goodbye. In total, Carolyn and Emmett had spent approximately one minute alone together, but that 60-second meeting would cost a life and propel the mid-century civil rights movement forward. Although she claimed to be, quote, scared to death by Emmett, Carolyn then remembered that she followed him outside, where a group of eight or nine local African Americans were standing, and walked past them all to retrieve a pistol, which for some reason was under the driver's seat in her sister-in-law's car. Emmett, she testified, was still loitering on the porch just outside the store, where he catcalled her by whistling. He then got into a car with some of the others and left. One of the last questions her husband's defense attorney asked before she left the stand was, Did you have any white men anywhere around there to protect you that night? Carolyn answered, No. This testimony under oath differed from the initial statement Carolyn gave police the day after her husband and brother-in-law were arrested. In her original version of events, she said that Emmett had, quote, insulted her, but not grabbed her or attempted to sexually assault her. It also differed from defense attorney Carlton's own pretrial statements to the press, which described Emmett as, quote, a menace to white womanhood who propositioned, assaulted, mauled, tussled, and made indecent proposals to Carolyn. Carolyn claims she mostly remembers thinking the same refrain over and over during the trial, that her husband may be going to the penitentiary, that she had children to support, that they would have no father. These thoughts were only interrupted by Mamie's testimony. As a fellow mother, Carolyn wondered how Mamie was able to endure the trial. The prosecutor delivered an emotional closing argument that sounded very much like a Southern sermon. It brought tears to some of the spectators and also to his clothing. His shirt was soaked in sweat by the time it was over. In their closing arguments, the defense argued openly for jury nullification the same sort of tactics O.J. Simpson's lawyers took in 1994. Attorney John Witten told the jury, quote, It is within your power to disregard all the facts, the evidence, and the law, and bring in any decision you like based upon any whim. There is no way anyone can punish you for any decision you make. You are our hope and confidence to send these defendants back to their families happy. Every last Anglo-Saxon one of you has the courage to do it. Whitten also suggested that Emmett wasn't actually dead, that Uncle Moses Wright and the NAACP sent Emmett back to the north, bound a decaying corpse somewhere, and planted Emmett's ring on it. The day the trial ended, both Carolyn and Roy initially looked nervous. But within an hour, both Roy and J.W. had lit big cigars in anticipatory celebration. After only an hour's deliberation, the jury returned its verdict, not guilty. This is an unusually short amount of time to bring in a verdict on a murder trial. But one juror said later that, quote, if we hadn't stopped to drink pop, it wouldn't have taken that long. So they had pretty much already made up their minds at the onset. Photographs were published showing both couples, Roy and Carolyn, and J.W. and his wife Juanita, smooching in the courtroom for stage publicity shots. Carolyn said later that the only thought running through her head was, oh, thank God, my children have a father. Carolyn's mother-in-law commented that it was a shame the pistol was in the car the day of Carolyn's encounter with Emmett. It could have, quote, saved them all that trouble. Shortly afterwards, former First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt wrote a newspaper editorial titled, I Think the Till Jury Will Have an Uneasy Conscience, in which she argued that the unjust verdict played right into communist propaganda, which mocked the U.S.'s self-proclaimed freedoms. Chester Himes, an African-American author who wrote one of my favorite books about Los Angeles during World War II called If He Hollers, Let Him Go, wrote the following to the editor of the New York Post. 
The real horror comes when your dead brain must face the fact that we as a nation don't want racial violence to stop. If we wanted to, we would. Three months after the verdict, Look Magazine offered JW and Roy $3,500, around $32,000 U.S. dollars in today's money, for an interview. Because they knew that they could not be tried again for the same crime according to double jeopardy laws, they were candid, extremely candid. JW told the article's writer in part, Well, what else could we do? I like N-words in their place. As long as I live and can do anything about it, N-words are going to stay in their place. N-words ain't going to vote where I live. They ain't going to go to school with my kids. And when an N-word even gets close to mentioning sex with a white woman, he's tired o' living. God damn you, I'm going to make an example of you, just so everybody can know where me and my folks stand. He then confessed that he and an unknown number of men, including Roy, drove to a cotton gin, took turns beating Emmett in the head with their guns, then forced him to carry a heavy fan to a waiting truck, took him to the riverbank, tied the fan around his neck, shot him in the head, and rolled him into the Tallahatchie River. Three days later, when he was found by two boys, his father's ring was his only identifying feature. In May of 1956, a protest rally was held at Madison Square Garden in New York City. Buoyed by the national outrage over the trial outcome, it called for eradicating the Jim Crow laws of the South and the complacency of the North. Among many notables present were Eleanor Roosevelt, Rosa Parks, Sammy Davis Jr., and jazz bandleader Cab Calloway. A year after the trial, Carolyn and Ray were passengers in a 1953 Chevy on State Highway 1 when the vehicle was involved in a late-night head-on collision. Both suffered only slight injuries and were treated and released at a hospital near Wayside, Mississippi. And after that, they mostly seemed to slip into obscurity, fade away into the mysterious Mississippi Delta. J.W. died in 1980, Roy in 1994. Carolyn has asserted that Roy was physically abusive to her. They divorced after the trial, and she remarried twice, had at least one other child, and lost a child of her own. She has written a memoir titled More Than a Wolf Whistle, the story of Carolyn Bryant Donham, which the University of South Carolina at Chapel Hill is holding in its Southern Historical Collections archive. It will not be released for scholars to view until the year 2038, at Carolyn's request. Carolyn's current whereabouts are a secret, closely guarded by her family. Well, now aren't you anxious to read that? Yes. I would think. You think that she's saying mm -hmm. it just never happened? But the title, More Than a Wolf Whistle. I feel like it's going to be a victimology. Like, you know, it's going to be about how wrong she was by all the publicity and everything. I don't think, oh, who knows, but... I mean, I feel like she's probably told all she's going to tell to Timothy Tyson, who wrote The Blood of Emmett Till, which is where I got a lot of this information, and told him what really happened. Who knows, you know, what else she has to provide to the public beyond that. But, I mean, I feel like it would be very interesting reading, and... I think she'll probably be dead in 2038, right? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Because she was born in the early 30s, so... Yeah, so she, she planned that for it to be released after her death. So in 1985, Roy was secretly recorded by a friend while he provided further details, or perhaps a revised version, of his state of mind during the murder. He claimed he had briefly thought about dumping Emmett's beaten body in front of a hospital before he died. In the recording, he says, quote, Well, we done whooped the son of a bitch, and I had backed out on killing the mother effer. Carrying him to the hospital wouldn't have done him no good. So instead, they put his ass in the Tallahatchie River. Early the next morning, a black man and his son had walked past J.W.'s truck and noticed a pool of blood that had dripped into the ground from the truck bed, which was covered with a tarp. J.W. told them he'd killed a deer. When the father pointed out that it wasn't deer season, J.W. yanked him over to the truck, pulled back a corner of the tarp, and said pointedly, This is what happens to smart in words. Speechless and horrified, the father pulled his son away and never told him what he'd seen under that tarp. J.W. sounds like a horrible guy. After his acquittal, J.W. and his sister Mary Louise were both convicted for food stamp fraud. In 2001, then-President Clinton officially pardoned Mary Louise just before leaving office, but never explained why. There are now historical markers by the river where Emmett's body was dumped and by the old deteriorating Bryant grocery store, but the riverfront sign is riddled with bullets and the sign by the store is constantly defaced and destroyed. 
Around 2004, Carolyn agreed to meet with historian Timothy Tyson to discuss the Emmett Till case. Her daughter-in-law had read a book he'd written about another lynching in the South and thought highly of it. During a face-to-face -face interview at her home, Carolyn finally confessed that her testimony, the official version of the sexual assault, had never happened. This was already fairly obvious, as J.W. and Roy had always referred to Emmett's alleged actions as only, quote, smart talk and ugly remarks, not touching, grabbing, or any other kind of sexual assault. But for the first time, the world was hearing this admission straight from the horse's mouth. Dr. Tyson personally felt that her trial testimony had been coerced, apparently by her husband and in-laws. Carolyn's nephew, Harvey T. Millam, son of J.W., has achieved his own brand of infamy. In 2016, his name was one among many mentioned in the notorious Panama Papers, which revealed the identities of heads of state, criminals, celebrities, and wealthy businessmen who illegally hid money in offshore tax havens. Harvey was sued for cheating investors out of money and settled the lawsuit without admitting wrongdoing. During his father's trial, Harvey was two years old and usually attended with his mother, at least once being allowed to sit on his father's, the defendant's lap. Jet Magazine reported that as a bored toddler in court, he once, quote, amused himself by slipping a rope around his brother's neck and tugging at it. He was raised on lynching. In July 2018, nearly 63 years after Emmett's death, the U.S. Department of Justice announced that they are reopening the investigation into his murder, although nearly all the involved parties are now deceased. They've alluded to receiving new information, but will not release any details. The night that J.W. and Roy kidnapped Emmett, his uncle, Reverend Wright, remembers that they took him out of the house to a vehicle parked in the dark. He thought he heard a voice ask, Is this the boy? And another, although he couldn't tell if it was male or female, answered, Yes. It's possible that this was Carolyn identifying Emmett as a boy who was in the store. Was she then an accessory to murder? However, she has always maintained that she stayed at the store and that when the men kidnapped Emmett and brought him to her, she refused to say it was the same boy she'd had a confrontation with earlier. This may be one of the questions the investigation is trying to sort out. That concludes today's Blast into the Past. If you've enjoyed our show, please pop over to iTunes and rate us. Thank you for listening and we'll be back soon to learn something new about the past together.